All right, thanks very much. <clears throat> uh, so this is what I'm going to cover today. I'm very happy to be here. I, I'm really pleased to to learn that there's a thriving UX uh, community in London, Ontario. So I'm just up the road in Guelph. Uh, so this is what I'm going to cover today. <clears throat> so I'm going to start by level setting, and we'll we'll define the thing just so we're all on the same page around what that is, what that means, and then we'll think a little bit about where we fit into the broader discipline. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to anchor some, I'm going to anchor part of my talk in my own journey and give you guys a sense of some of the things I've learned along the way that I keep going back to. So that's what you can expect. Um, <clears throat> so I think it uh, it's always useful to spell it out because when we say UX, sometimes we lose the fact that we're talking about people. So users are people who use the things that we design. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm having some throat challenges. <clears throat> so I'm not really stretched. But, uh, so as a discipline, um, one of the important things that we do is we, we understand user needs and challenges and expectations, and we do that by talking to people. Um, we use that to understand the problem space and inform the designs that we make. Uh, and we're designing not just a product or a screen, we're designing experiences that encompass more than just products. Uh, lots of touch points and lots of aspects of the brand. So how do we help businesses? I think it's always always useful to think about this. Um, <clears throat> so again, it's around that problem space. So uh, Often when we, we get pulled onto projects and maybe it's a highly pres prescriptive thing that we're asked to do, um, or it's a very narrow thing that we're asked to do, or both. Um, so it's always good to understand the broader context that gives us more room to play, and it helps us uh, really understand the problems that we're solving for. Uh, so, so we have this skill set, we have this perspective, and that's what we bring to the projects that we work on. Uh, and that allows us to, to hold things in balance. So we're not just thinking about business considerations, and we're not just thinking about technical constraints, but we're balancing that awareness and understanding of user needs with those considerations. And again, we're not just fixating on a particular product or a particular um, set of functionality within a product. We're looking at the overall experience. So this is this is a, a diagram that's been around for a while that I find myself going to quite often. Um, and <clears throat> pardon me, I like it because uh, it's not limited to usability, which is what some people conflate with UX. It's broader than that. Um, the only way we can really know these things is by talking to people. So knowing that it's of value to someone, <clears throat> knowing that it's desirable, knowing that there's utility in it. And uh, you can see accessibility here, and that's that's going to be a focus of one of the talks today. <clears throat> Pardon me. And... Uh, and I've seen someone actually add uh, ethical to this model, which is important uh, when we look at artificial intelligence and automated vehicles and things like that. Um, ethics becomes something you, you absolutely need to consider and design for as well. So this is this is a distillation of uh, of a diagram by Jesse James Garrett, and, and his diagram is more robust and detailed. But I find this one useful because it uses a metaphor that people can appreciate for one thing, but it also, <clears throat> excuse me, it also um, is grounded in user research, which is very important, uh, so that we can responsibly design out the rest of the experience and solve for those underlying problems, as I mentioned, and, and, and then creating the infrastructure to support the experience. And then the, the piece of it that people interact with and put their hands on and see uh, is the visual design. So one one small quibble with this diagram is that people aren't generally going out and admiring their roofs, but <clears throat> otherwise I think it holds together pretty well. So, um, And then just, I'm, I'm inverting that model now, so now we're going sequential. So we start with strategic activities, um, and these include user research, and then once we have an understanding of the people we're designing for, we can create personas that um, distill them into an individual that we can then use as a point of reference when we're creating things and when we're talking about the problems we're solving. 
Uh, we can look at the competitive landscape, and uh, if we're not designing something new, if we're just looking at an existing product, we can bring some heuristics into it through an expert review, and then we can take what we've learned and take those insights and we can distill them into principles. And principles are useful because they're grounded in all of the things that we've learned, but they, they're also, <clears throat> pardon me, a language that we can share with the rest of our team and another way to, that we're providing context for our colleagues. And then some of the structural items are around content and how content is structured, uh, making sure that whatever user goals or objectives there are are, are baked into the into the infrastructure that we create. Um, and then just some activities like usability studies and starting to think about the interactions as well. And then that sensory part where we're starting to we're starting to um, conceptualize what the thing can look like and what the design is and drawing patterns from that and creating prototypes uh, <clears throat> as a communication tool for, for our team. So, so now we've, we've, we've defined it in a sense. I mean, other people define it different ways or think about it using different metaphors, but, uh, so let's, let's think about where it fits in an organization now. Um, <clears throat> I like this visualization of it because it's a little bit messy. <laughs> um, it has the word human in it and, uh, and there's overlap. So, Overlap's an important thing uh, because where it gets messy, that's where the, there are some opportunities to uh, to work with our colleagues and um, bring more perspectives into the project, and um, and again keep building and sharing that context that helps everyone understand the problem space and what we're doing, uh, so so that we can craft exceptional experiences. And usually, people people are drawn to UX because they care about people, and so we have that passion. And we have that rigor around wanting to understand people and bring that empathy into what we're creating. And so that's an important thing that we also provide on our project teams or within our companies. So uh, I've had a chance to reflect on how to help people in the discipline, how to coach people. I've, I've done mentoring for quite a few years. I've done workshops. and different talks, and one of my earlier talks, I reached out to the other presenters, and Trip Odell gave me some answers that I've been going to ever since, so I'm sharing those with you. He makes this distinction, and I share it with you so that you can look at the definition and look at what he says about it and uh, see whether that resonates with you and see how that fits for you. So this is how he just defines artisan. <clears throat> so you can have a look and you can see whether anything jumps out at you, whether that resonates with you. And this, these are some things an artisan might do or provide. So it's that, that visualization, it's those, those discrete interactions um, and, and breaking it down into those fine details and making sure that that's crafted very well. And then, and then there are storytellers. And, <clears throat> These are the people who think about the broader context and user needs and uh, think strategically and, and do some of that underlying research that helps inform um, our products, product design. So these are, so they, they, they help unpack, identify and unpack some of the underlying challenges that we're trying to help people with, uh, what, what people's attitudes and expectations are. Um, and articulate these things through, through personas and scenarios and potentially journey maps that encompass uh, many aspects of interactions with a company's products and services and defining some of those structures that hold things together and the workflows that we're, that we're providing for people <clears throat> or enabling for people. So this is a point where you can just maybe think a little bit about where do you fit? And, and, I'm, and it's not a strictly binary thing either. So. Uh, maybe you're both, or maybe some aspects of each appeal to you. So, or you might find you have a very strong comfort zone on one side, but you would you actually think you could maybe stretch a little bit on the other side. <clears throat> so one thing, so we've used a house metaphor, and it's a it's a useful metaphor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ground some of this conversation in a kitchen renovation. So 
I think we all have kitchens. <laughs> We've all been in kitchens. So uh, think about your kitchen or a kitchen you've been in and something that you feel is grievous about it or that irritates you about it. And you're welcome to share, shout it out if you want, or just think about it. Counter space? I heard counter space. What was the other one? Cupboards. Cupboards. What about them? Never enough. Storage. Okay. So you're mad at that corner cupboard. Okay. <laughs> What's that? You love your window, so light is important to you. Okay. So yeah, we all have our issues with various kitchens. Um, so I'm going to talk about one of my renovations. I say one like I do it all the time, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, so we're, we're talking about the same elements here. So understanding user needs, making sure that infrastructure is in place for the things you want to do, um, understanding that storage is important, light's important, uh, and then making sure that whatever the outcome is, it reflects who you are as a person um, and that you enjoy using it. So if these if some of these things are missing you can have a very slick looking kitchen that irritates you or doesn't doesn't work for you doesn't help you do what you need to do <clears throat> and it's 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 specific it's what do these users want and need so you learn that through interviews you you learn that through going into someone's environment and observing them using their kitchen asking them to to whip you up a nice uh, pasta putinesca, I don't know. So, um, you, you and then and then that's when you maybe un uncover some of these issues or concerns. So technically, we don't we don't do this stuff on our own selves. I'm just doing this for illustration purposes. But we had a functional kitchen. It was so functional that I was willing to live with it for about ten years. <clears throat> but my nickname is the Optimizer. And <laughs> there was room to make it better. And I would see those things and go, Ugh. and and there were some unmet needs in the space. So one of them was I was tired of seeing all the daily stuff that accumulates on a on a counter when you have a kid in school and the phones that are being recharged. And uh, also we have two nice dogs and they were their food dishes were in our dining room and it was kind of we didn't care but it was kind of gross so uh, maybe we should fix that because we like to have people over occasionally so um, this is the after shot and I probably should have tidied a little more but uh, what you can see here is the the desk that solved for one of those problems so <clears throat> on the right is a is a desk there's a charging space we don't have a landline anymore but um, that that outlet actually has um, USB ports so we can directly plug our phones in uh, and we can now sit at our peninsula again because we took care of this underlying problem. So this is the discrete dining space for puppies and there are the puppies and they are good dogs and they sit and they wait until we say okay and then they go and they eat. <laughs> and so it's not in the middle of the dining room anymore and because I'm the optimizer measured action Jackson, gave him not standing because you don't eat with your head up, you eat with the head down when you're a dog. So um, four centimeters of extra buffer and solved that problem for us. Such good dogs too. <laughs> so and then we think it, so we think about some of these underlying needs and we, we solve for those. And then we think about what we do in the space or what we're what we're hiring the, the thing to do. So what are we trying to accomplish? And what do what's the infrastructure we need? So if there's a faucet, let's make sure <laughs> we've got some plumbing serving the faucet. If we've got a charging station, make sure we've got appropriate outlets for that. <clears throat> and then we think about the flow. We think about flow. So in the case of my kitchen, it's a, tr it's a traffic area. So we have to accommodate flow from other rooms. And we have to think about flow within the space in the context of particular tasks. And we could break it down into emptying the dishwasher or sauteing something or um, any any getting getting breakfast together. So <clears throat> these are things we can consider. So here, here's an example of fixing for flow. So uh, in the previous kitchen, it wasn't a counter depth fridge. It wasn't French doors, and so you could clock someone <laughs> when you open the fridge door, or you were at, at 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 best you were disrupting someone who was trying to walk through. Except for Miss Muggins, who's much shorter. <clears throat> 
So we, we already talked about having the charging near the desk. Um, proximity to, so having your cutlery drawer near your dishwasher to make it easier to empty your dishwasher. And, and having, having things close to your cooktop that you would need in the context of cooking a meal. So here's the cooktop. And there's the pots. And there's the cooking oil. You would almost think I cooked. <laughs> And then, and then that sensory exterior needs to, so for me, this was a kitchen I was thinking about for a long time, and it reflected my, my um, design preferences and sort of my brand, I guess you can call it that. But um, talk about engendering trust, I guess, <laughs> I don't know about that in my kitchen, but certainly the things that we work on, I guess no one, I don't want anyone to think they'll get botulism or <laughs> get sick from eating in my kitchen, but... Um, and then, and then making sure that people can, can discover the things that they need to accomplish their tasks and, and understand how it is that that's to be done. Design can communicate that as well, or it should. Um, except sometimes you can choose to break these rules. So a pocket door that helps, uh, filter the noise or hide the mess, should that ever happen. Um, or a dishwasher that, and sorry, crooked shot, but that's the dishwasher. <clears throat> And you could argue that family members, they know where it is. People who don't know where it is, I don't think probably should be loading my dishwasher. So that's okay. <laughs> so now I'm just going to shift. We've gone from, from a physical structure, from a house. Now I'm going to talk about journeys because I think we're all on a journey in relation to user experience and we're all at various places on our journey and there are many ways you can get there and many stories around how everyone in this room has a different story. So I'm just going to walk you through my journey and not like an old timer who's, hopefully not like an old timer who's just <laughs> telling salty old tales, but um, just, just, is this better or is this better? This, keep it higher? Is it going in and out in a weird way or? Okay, okay. Um, so just more, what are things that I've, I've learned and kept with me along the way, or keep learning? <clears throat> so this is my journey. I hope that's not too eye strain inducing. Can you read that? I hope you can read that. Yes, okay, Susie says yes. I trust Susie. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna walk you through these different aspects. So. I say education, but things that I've learned, um, so not necessarily as formal as education, the roles that I've been in, and places where I've taken stock or shifted my direction. So I'm going to start with education. <clears throat> so, <laughs> you know, you saw, so Canadian literature, philosophy, a bit of fine art, woo, and, uh, <laughs> and then a slightly more practical MA in rhetoric where I did a co-op, did some co-op terms, but I don't regret any of it. I learned great things, and learning is learning is always awesome, especially when you're interested in it. And and critical thinking is important. And I think we get we have a STEM fixation right now, but we forget that you know some some people are more comfortable with ambiguity and not in knowing oh there there's more than one way to get there or achieve something, and that's sort of what we bring as UX practitioners and how we can help organizations. I mean, there's still rigor around what we do, but we do think differently, and that's a good thing. So <clears throat> you can see, I talk about longevity, so I, I didn't go, okay, <laughs> hello world, I have an MA in rhetoric, and I'm done with the learning thing. This is something that we just, we, we learn and we grow all the time, especially in a dynamic discipline like user experience. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, so then I became a tech writer and in a big company. So I'd started in a small company for one co-op and then I went into IBM and that was a whole other thing. Uh, and then I went into a more moderately sized company at the time. It was Blackberry and at the time there were like 500 people. Um, and that's when I started, collect I know, so I'm, I am old, I admit it, but um, <laughs> that's when I started, there was like a double A battery in the Blackberry when I worked there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, so I, I learned about collaboration because I just, I, 
I didn't know it wasn't a thing that everybody did, and so I just put on my shoes and walked across the street and introduced myself to the guys on the phones who talked to the people that I was writing content for, because I wanted to understand them better. And what are you guys hearing about? What makes people upset? What are they having trouble with? So starting to collaborate and starting to learn to take ownership of my career, because if I don't own it, who's going to own it for me? So um, and what that looked like was just in the process of, of being a writer, uh, the product was maturing and changing, and so we had a we had a bunch of servers that did the same thing for different mail platforms. So uh, I, when IBM Lotus Domino was a thing, <laughs> and Microsoft Exchange, and so uh, somebody somebody realized we can actually rearchitect these servers so that they're more the code is consistent except for the exceptions for these mail platforms. So. And then that was an opportunity to do the same thing with the content we were writing. And so that what that was, was that was content strategy and information architecture. And that wasn't something anyone had identified yet. And so I saw an opportunity to help align what we were writing. And so I asked for a mandate and I called the thing information architecture. And I said, that's, that's what I would like to do for the company. And so, and sometimes you ask, to be an information architect, and, the, and you're made a team lead. <laughs> and so I was told, oh yeah, we'll just, we'll make you a team lead, and then you can do that, and also lead these people, and suddenly five people was 12 people, and the IA piece was really little, and the leading piece was big, and, but it gave me an opportunity, and it was an opportunity to think about leadership, and to think about how to mentor people, um, and help them grow in their roles. And also learn, okay, I don't think I'm actually ready to focus on this. Not that I ever asked, but <laughs> I, I, I want, I still, there are things I still want to do and explore. So, and that was a useful thing to learn. <clears throat> so this is where I reflected and said, okay. Um, and I had to think about writing. So writing was the thing that I was. Writing, I was a writer. I studied writing and that's what I did. And, but when I reflected on what I enjoyed about it, I realized actually the pieces that appeal to me are is everything that leads up to the writing part. And then the writing part is the thing that I did, almost muscle memory, and, and that was sort of the cost of doing the other things. And so I learned that even though I was labeling myself that and, and that I was actually pretty good at it, I, that's not what I wanted to focus on or what I wanted to do. So that was useful to learn. And because I'm analytical, <laughs> I and because I'd already asked for that once and was taken in a different direction, I wanted some certainty or a little more certainty. So I took that opportunity to actually through University of Waterloo, there's some career a career group where you can go and have a Myers-Briggs test. And they, they augmented it with the skills inventory. Um, and that allowed me to reflect on some of my characteristics and what might be a good fit for me in terms of a career or a focus. And, uh, and, and something that I appreciated about the skills inventory was that it actually, you didn't just reflect on your work self, you reflected on your, your, yourself. <laughs> and, and you thought about things that you did with a great deal of passion or that you really enjoyed. And it actually, there was a there was part of it where you asked other people to reflect on what they've observed about you and and for me it was useful to see how I was perceived as well as uh, evaluate what I really enjoyed <clears throat> and then I went back and said you remember that thing <laughs> that I asked for let's how about we try that like actually doing that for a while so um, and and in the meantime I was taking library and information science courses and it helped me be a better information architect. And so I, I explored, I learned a lot of things about, I mean, this is a discipline where they thought deeply around a lot of things around organization and labeling and those types of systems. Um, I also encountered a wonderful article by a woman named Marcia Bates, Marcia or Marcia, I've heard it both, but um, called Berry Picking, and it was about how it's a non-linear path to finding information and the role of serendipity <clears throat> and and discovery so that that search isn't always enough for for people especially people who don't know exactly what they're looking for 
and learned some of the formal structures that get applied to information. And I learned it's okay to be feral. <laughs> and by feral, I'm, I'm, I'm actually referring to an article that I read as part of that program. Um, and he, and somebody, and I, I can't think of his name right now, but um, he coins the term feral professionals, and he's talking about it in relation to library science, which has a fair amount of rigor around it, and um, and a pretty formalized. It's a it's a MLA certified, so it's a certificate program, which means there are. It's pretty narrow in terms of um, rubrics and being being graded for for the work that you do, and it also it it also means it's not completely consistent with what's going on in the wild <laughs> currently. And so what I found was that I knew things from being a practitioner that were at odds with how I was learning or, or the types of assignments that I needed to be doing. I actually um, did a web course and I redid my major project because my major project was a website for, um, for a trail organization and I felt so badly about how he was made to do it according to the rubric that I redid the whole thing. So, <laughs> again, I guess that's the, you know, the optimizer side of me. But uh, so I, so I learned, you know what, it's okay to be feral and to, and to do that learning in the context of the problem you're trying to solve, and and it's okay to quit. <laughs> so I quit. I I have two thirds of a library and information science degree, and I'm really okay with that. <clears throat> Um, so then I became an actual information architect, uh, and I learned by being feral. I learned in the wild, and I did the things. I did content audits, I did card sorts, I did user research, started exploring uh, some of the tools around search engine optimization so I could help people label things appropriately so that they could be found. Um, and I established a practice. So prior to prior to me holding that title at BlackBerry, there was not that practice didn't exist. Um, and at the same time, I I helped my colleagues think differently. And I I think that's one thing that we do as user experience practitioners is sometimes we help people think about things differently. We we help them think about the problem space. Or in this case, we we help writers remember that we're writing for people and that it's important that people can find and use what we're crafting for them. So in the case of these writers, what I did is I was looking at search metrics um, within our organization and realizing that we had some unsuccessful searches um, where content actually existed but was not labeled in a way that um, matched the mental models of the people who were looking for this stuff. And so I would approach the writers and some of them were very receptive to what I had to say, and some were a little frightened or ambivalent, and I tended to work more closely with the people who are receptive, um, help them understand how they could employ these tools in the course of doing their jobs, and then help them coach their colleagues so that their colleagues could start bringing these practices into play. And, um, and eventually we were able to, we co-presented on, on and we, we said it takes five minutes to do this type of research and this is how it helps you. And and uh, the writer had some very practical advice for her colleagues and we started changing the culture of the writing group and eventually they were receptive to making that part of their process. So sometimes you have to go about it quite slowly, but just even helping helping a handful of your colleagues think differently is is useful and helpful to the, to the company. And then I got made a team lead again, <laughs> which, I mean, I was asked. I mean, they didn't totally make me, but, um, and I was really interested in the practice. I was, I was using the tools, and this, this was an opportunity for me to get even more well acquainted with some of these tools and understand how, how that practice works within a broader organization and how to, how to sell it so that people on the team had room to actually practice that craft um, and and bring those skills into our product into our product process and cycles um, <clears throat> and uh, so so I also helped people on my team understand that and it's something that that is easily forgotten by myself and I, I see people forgetting it all the time because we get busy uh, and we forget that 
we have a lot of skills around empathy and reading situations and understanding problem spaces. Um, but we don't always apply that in the, in the course of doing our work. And so um, there were cases where uh, I was able to coach someone on my team and help them understand that an 82-page report, while very rigorous, is probably not going to be read by the CEO. And so how about, so the, here's some really good substance that's going to be very persuasive from page 78 to 82. Let's make a PowerPoint out of that and then cite this paper and make it available on the network so that people appreciate the rigor behind what we do, but you're making it manageable and actionable in the context of, of this business. And this person's reaction was to say, well, but this is a perfectly acceptable academic report style, and which gave me an opportunity to remind him that we were in a business context and that we have to, we have to adjust our, our approaches and use our skills around empathy and problem solving within the context of our companies as well. So that was useful and that's something I continue to, to have to remember myself and, and help other people learn about as well. Uh, I also learned that when you're asked to be a team lead of a team of 12 people and then you're asked to make a whole brand new website for all of the documentation for a company, for developers and administrators and smartphone users, that, that's a lot. <laughs> so <clears throat> this is another point where I stopped and reflected and decided if I didn't focus, I wouldn't be successful. So I had to ask for that focus. And as much as I really appreciated working with the UX team and, and uh, helping them out, um, I was... That was always my priority, was always the human side, and, and, but I was also going to be measured on the success of this website. So I said, you know, I, you know how we joke about me wearing two hats? <laughs> like, here, have this hat. <laughs> and, I, and then I didn't, I didn't uh, that didn't end my relationship with the UX team or with the practice. And then so I transitioned into being a UX practitioner, and that's where I actually said, um, can we just for a while, can we not make me a manager <laughs> anymore? <laughs> and, and that's when I was told, okay, but then you'll be off the management track. And I said, that was actually not a thing I realized I was on. So I'm probably, probably good with that for now. So I'll call you. <laughs> so, and I, I label this UX practitioner, but my, my title was information architect. Um, but I was doing more of the broad work and I was in a space in the company where they didn't have a lot of resources to do like the full UX work on the product space too. So it was the developer experience and that gave me a little bit of license. We talk about that, um, that overlap or some of that ambiguity that gives you a bit of, a bit of wiggle room or room to maneuver. So, um, and I learned some important things in this role and, Unexpectedly, so we had a team. So by this time, we were a pretty bloated company, um, and we had acquired a team in Sweden because they had done really beautiful designs in the mobile space, and they were the engine behind BlackBerry 10, which was our our big consumer um, offering, where we where we deliberately pivoted away from our ex pretty exclusive focus in the business space. So. Um, they were doing delightful things. They were an agency. They were from Sweden. And so they don't really know, they couldn't really identify the train that ran over them <laughs> when they got folded into this larger company and with a very different culture. And they were chafing to a certain degree. And I guess we found each other because we were working, there was overlap on what we were working but with or on, but uh, we also had some shared values and, and we seem to be pushing for similar things around user experience and um, our approach and, and, and so we just, we started collaborating and uh, it was quite delightful and, well I thought it was, I don't know how they felt but, um, and then there was an opportunity to, to help bring some other people on board and so in this case, uh, for, for iPhone and for Android, there's guidelines around creating applications for those platforms. And the guidelines are meant to really showcase 
the OS and showcase the design and, and the design patterns. And um, ours wasn't there yet. Ours was still a byproduct of this more corporate uh, focus. And uh, so they, they wanted to give that resource a lift. And they were feeling very frustrated with the group that was responsible for that document or that artifact. And um, I had an opportunity to talk to the manager, and he said, well, we're going to Malmoize it. <laughs> and Malmoize it means import it into Sweden and make it awesome and magic it up and then and export it back to Canada. And... Uh, <laughs> And my, what came up for me when, when they said that was then you're losing an opportunity to bring someone along with you, and that person is the writer who's responsible for that. So how do we get some of that Malmo goodness, you know, back in Canada or with someone who, who can internalize it and, and then keep that, keep that resource awesome and not need to Malmoize it every year? <laughs> so um, I had that conversation, and that, that resulted in... A collaborative exercise where um, they asked me to be involved too, which was unexpected, but and the writer, and we went to Malmo and, or sorry, Malmo, and uh, <laughs> we, we did a collaborative exercise, and the writer was very much engaged. Um, we talked to people who were really angry about it. There were people who had strong feelings about it. I am trying to use this. There are things that I need. I can't do my job. We talked to those people. We, we, we actually, we printed out the whole thing and we took every topic on little strips of paper <laughs> and put it on a whiteboard with magnets and moved it around and labeled it and, um, reworked it and put it in front of some of the angriest people and just said, you know, tell us about what you're looking at. And one of the biggest detractors said, that actually solves all of my concerns and addresses all of the gaps. And which was funny because we hadn't added anything. <laughs> so, and, and so the writer was like, that was amazing and, and, and had a very strong reaction. And then when I asked her after we were back in Canada, I said, so what, like, tell me what that experience was like for you. She kept coming back to that powerful moment when she realized that the labeling and the organizing, if you're doing it in a way that's meaningful to people, it really changes it. And so she had that context and she was able to internalize that experience and, and continue to sort of shepherd th that, resource and make sure that it was reflecting all of those principles and practices. So I learned a few things. I learned that <laughs> those were kind of my people and that uh, that felt like a better fit for me, that some of the things I was maybe chafing at or that added a bit of friction or overhead to me that I, that I maybe hadn't even recognized or articulated was maybe around my, my corporate uh, context. Plus, Malmo is pretty awesome. But <laughs> um, so I so I did some thinking, and I chose to shift to an agency, and, and in a mindful way as well, because you hear about innies and outies, and how people who are embedded within an organization with a particular focus and product, you learn different things there than you do in an agency. So, um, in the way I affected that shift was to take a step back. Um, my mo was anytime I was asked to talk, I would say. Yes, <laughs> and that had to do with uh, some like discomfort and maybe getting out of my comfort zone a little bit. Um, and then I looked at my own self and my resume and all of the supporting materials as a design problem and a branding exercise. So how do I, what, who am I as a brand and what is my story and how can I reflect that in the design of the materials and in the way that I craft my messages? So um, that's what I did. And then I pivoted to an agency, and um, <clears throat> I started as the UX lead, and then uh, was later uh, promoted to associate creative director. Um, and and I learned again about collaboration, and in this case, uh, bringing that context and doing it early and often, being transparent about the process, and and reaching out to people with insights iteratively as they arose, so that everyone was along for the ride. And by everyone, I mean people people coding it, people writing the copy. Um, I didn't use any lorem ipsum text or bacon ipsum or hipster ipsum or whatever ipsum, um, and, and doing the visual design. And in some cases, engaging people in collaborative exercises. In other cases, just grinding through all the content and letting people know what I learned. 
um, and the client as well. And the byproduct of that with the client was uh, greater trust and awareness of the process. And so in, a, in an agency space where often the client will go with a gut read and then be very prescriptive and just tell you what to do or that needs to be read or we need a you know, we need to get a quote button up here or, with our, or that persist down the side or, you know, they have their shiny things that they like. But if you, if you're transparent about the process and, and you're very much engaging them, they don't have a surprise at the end or they don't wonder where this thing came from. They're, they're exposed to the rigor that we have around the practice. And so when I, when I asked other people to reflect on that uh, several of the projects I was on when I was early at this agency, I learned that it was typical to have six design revisions with a client. And for this project I was asking around, we had one. And, and they signed off on it with a few minor revisions, which was very unusual. Um, <clears throat> and I, want, I like to take credit for that. <laughs> but I think that the trust and the ongoing engagement was a part of that. And then I also was looking at, when we think about how are we successful as practitioners, I feel like I'm successful when I create context for other people, um, when I'm collaborative, and um, but also when we, when the work that we do finds its way out into the world and in the, in the hands of the people we use it for and is successful over time. And so uh, when I was looking at the client relationship, I realized that we had this new website for a very nimble small company and a, a very nervous marketing writer who's the only writer in the company. <clears throat> and so I realized she, she was feeling anxious about keeping the site fresh and having content. And when I was on site talking to the, some of the food scientists there, so it was a stevia company, um, people actually wore lab coats that work. Uh, I said, you know, I understand that actually some of your colleagues, they're, um, they're, they're, they have to write blog content. They're supposed to write a blog article every month. And they don't seem very happy about that. So wouldn't you look like a hero if you went in and said, if you spend half an hour of your over lunch with me and talk to me about what you're working on, I will create your blog content. And then she would have an opportunity to keep the blog fresh, still cite who, who was providing that, those ideas, um, and then maybe ask some additional questions to, to um, give fuel for, for some other content on the site. And so I saw this person, and by helping her solve for that problem of keeping the site fresh, because I didn't want to sort of airlift a brand new website into their company that they couldn't maintain, and then they would wait two years and then call the agency again. So um, by the end of it, she had embraced all of the principles and things that went into creating this content for food scientists that was on brand, um, so not too sciencey, quite natural. There were different different aspects she was able to take away and internalize, and she, I, I really felt like she had a sense of ownership and agency, so to speak, by, by the time that project was wrapping up. I felt like it was in good hands. Uh, and I learned some things about agencies. I learned, yeah, the variety and pace is fun. I got to learn about stevia. I got to learn about um, sensory testing apparatus for taste and mouthfeel and scent and just weird stuff I wouldn't have been able to dig deep on. Um, but because of where I was situated in this company, the user research was something that I was never going to have a strong mandate to do. So I was able to squeak some in, in some cases, but, um, and that was something, you know, the people <laughs> were missing from my practice. So that led me to another, another uh, company, this time a small company. Um, and I learned that ambiguity is your friend. <laughs> so it's an opportunity. So I came in as the only UX person that they'd ever explicitly hired. Um, and that if you can, if you can create an atmosphere of trust and, or have that as part of your identity, um, that c you can create opportunities for yourself and for the practice. So, uh, because if they, and so, if you're if you're trying to think of well how can I do more UX or how do I get into UX um, and you have a skill set that someone is conflating with UX it's not quite there um, 
you could go in there and you could and you could be transparent about it in the interview process and say this is what I do, but but UX is bigger than this, and I can help introduce that into your company. Or if you're in a role like that, you can start creating those broader opportunities for yourself. So, um, so that was something that that I learned there, and and I also used through through empathy, through understanding some of the challenges of my, of my colleagues. I I was able to do some research as well because my uh, the product managers their bonus was actually tied to them completing X number of user interviews a week. And they didn't have time and they, and they didn't necessarily have comfort in their expertise around that. And so I was able to say, I need to do this for my job. Um, I'll make you an important stakeholder. You tell me what you want to learn and I will craft a protocol that reflects that. You can be in on every call. I will share all of my insights with you. And, um, so th through that, I was able to formalize the research part of the practice, and and this was a this was a company where we talked about user, the user experience uh, practice balancing out the business needs and and the technical considerations. This is one where I really felt like for a time we achieved that balance, and um, I helped. I always so one of the measures I use with myself is did have I helped people think differently. And uh, so in this case, there was, there was a moment that was quite challenging. So, so this is a little tech company, well, little, there are fewer than 100 people are around there at the time. Um, and it was a really technically driven company. It was a robust uh, server, hardware, um, appliance that shaped network traffic. It said, oh, you're Skype for business here. Um, pleased to be using this very large pipe. Oh, sorry, you're online gaming here. You need to sip through this little straw, shaping traffic, keeping the business running. Um, so very robust, lots of features. Assumption that it's a technical audience and that they would have this endless tolerance for complexity. And so I was trying to change that. Um, I had done, I had actually done an audit. I'd mapped out the information architecture. I could not fit it on a piece of paper, my mind map. I had to do it on, across multiple sheets and tape it together. And that was only the scene part of the navigation. So, um, so we're in a room and we're thinking about, okay, we're going to shift from this physical appliance to a cloud solution. Um, what does this thing need to look like? And one of my colleagues got up with a with a whiteboard marker and said, "Okay, well, which features do we need?" <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but I went eh, like it hurt my heart. And so I and and I thought I can't like we can't go down this road right now. So I did a little timeout sign, <laughs> and I said, "Can I have?" And I can't remember if I asked for ten minutes. I think it was like I need to make it a small enough amount. Um, can I have ten minutes to talk about verbs? <laughs> And it kind of caught him a bit short. It caught me a bit short because I didn't know where that came from. But um, so, and I had I had uh, post-it notes because you know we all have those on our person, right? And um, <laughs> I said, okay, like we've done research and we've talked to the people on the phones. What is it that people want to do? Let's write these things down. And so we wrote the thing. And I said, what? Do, and what do they do with urgency? What do they do with frequency? And we wrote them down, we stuck them up on the board, we did the affinity mapping. The person I interrupted, his body language was kind of like, I'm going to try, but I don't know how I feel about this. So very ambivalent body language, and then starting to relax. And by the end of it, he was like on the roller coaster. And, and, uh, and so I saw his attitude shift over time, over just the course of those 10 minutes. And at the end, we had a system that fed into the information architecture of the new solution. Uh, I was one of the inputs. And I had, I had a colleague who trusted me and who was thinking differently. And it was interesting because when they closed the company, which they did, <laughs> that was exciting. So, um, I said, I was the first UX person you worked with. Like, tell me about that. And I had taken that away as a very powerful story um, myself. And he said, he cited that as well. He said, that just changed that. I don't even know what that was, but that really changed the way I thought. I said, I didn't know what it was either. <laughs> so that was an obvious inflection point when they close your company. Uh, so... I took it as an opportunity to, I was reflecting on that, um, that exercise, that skills inventory, and I thought, 
the, that useful aspect of getting other people's perception <clears throat> might really balance out my own thinking. So, uh, so I, I actually just put it out on Facebook and just asked, you know, what have you, what have you seen me do with a lot of enthusiasm or a lot of skill and, and how do you view me? And, and, uh, that was useful feedback because I realized I'd, I'd only ever been a leader, if not under duress, certainly not <laughs> through my own request. And so, and that had maybe given me an attitude toward leadership that I needed to rethink because I'd always enjoyed mentoring people. And this was a way for me to pull that into my own job. So that brought me to my current role. You like the hair? <laughs> Did that myself. Um, so now I'm at uh, a company that uh, I'm leading a UX practice or alongside a colleague um, and we make, we make, we help people learn. Um, and so I've been able to explore maturing a practice again in that engineering context and, and trying to pull pull the practice out and be have it be held in balance with engineering and um, and the business side of things and doing that through various ways of advocating for the practice um, by in part by doing the things and making the contributions by informing people by bringing people along and and I get to care about things that I care about in in the course of doing that. So I'm going to quickly toggle to things that we look for because I think probably this is something people like to know about. Um, any other leaders in the room, they feel free to tell me I'm missing something or, or that they have a different take on it. But we do look for practice knowledge, but that doesn't mean I've done all of the things. It means I know there are a lot of things <laughs> and I know w w generally when to employ them. And here are some examples of how I've done it, and that you have a story, you have a narrative, you you can speak to your process. You're not just putting shiny things up and and um, wanting me to be seduced by that. So, uh, and then soft skills are is really important. I would rather have someone. We talk about education. It's not a thing that ends. It's an ad like talking about learning and an attitude toward learning. So rather than understanding these tools. I would rather know that you know which tools to employ and that you're resilient and that you're agile enough to pick up on whatever tools or make up some crazy thing about verbs or whatever, you know, whatever the case calls for. So, um, I don't want to take clouds. It's been a while, but <laughs> it does, they do communicate a lot of words at once. This is what I heard back from other, other leaders when I asked that question more broadly. So you don't see anything about tools. All I said is, what do you look for in people when you're hiring? This is the answer I got. And there's nothing here that, uh, I don't feel as well. So, so this is, my journey. I, I ended with a note and it's kind of sinister because it's like, I don't want to end where I am now, but I don't know where this is going. It's maybe not one note or it's just, anyway. So this is one path. This is, this is my path. Um, you don't have to do all these things, but maybe some of the things that I've pulled out and reflected on with you, you can, they might help you think, think about your own craft and your own practice and where you live in it. <clears throat> so, this is what I'd like you to maybe take away from the building part. Overla the overlap is where the fun is, and where do you live in terms of being an artisan or a storyteller, or both? And then, this is the meaty slide that I will pause on. So all of those little items that I've highlighted, they sort of distill down into these things that you can think about. <clears throat> A lot of words, sorry about that. I wanted them on one slide for your convenience. <laughs> and then the obligatory, hey, thanks. 